Hello, everybody. Thanks for stopping by for this great conversation. My name is Richard Liu. It's really great to be here, uh, to have you here for what I find was a very important, compelling documentary short uh, with a familiar face or two, uh, the filmmakers of the new short documentary, Pandemic 19. Um, please welcome the husband and wife team. I don't get to say that very often when it comes to filmmaking, uh, Young Chang as well as Annie Katsua Rollins. They both directed a Pandemic 19 together. Um, and I think they do know how to, there, here they are, ladies and gentlemen, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just push the button, but yeah, there we are, here we are. Hello, hello. Hi there, Good Richard. Both of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So first off, um, when you think of Pandemic 19 today versus when you started the concept, um, there's always obviously been a long arc of why you did it and what it means, but take us back to when you got the idea and how many hot dogs and uh, chips and salsa you were eating at that time. <laughs> uh, you time. know, it really feels like so many years ago that it, <laughs> that it was ever before <laughs> a pandemic hit us uh, here, here in North America. Yeah. But um, it was, it was, I think early, late February or early March, 2020. And, you know, it was we February. Were just, February. Yeah. And we were just so naive, so naive. We'd heard, of course, there was a, you know, COVID-19 and come out of Wuhan. Where were you again? Where were you? Where were you? We're in Toronto we at this time. We are in Toronto currently. Yeah. Okay. She's American. I'm, Sorry so, to hear about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we, you know, we, we just, we just heard that it had started spreading Italy, you know, the, the virus had landed in Italy, but we just somehow never, ever thought of the possibility of it coming to North America and what it might, what it might do to our everyday lives. But I have a best friend in Minneapolis uh, in the U.S. who is an anesthesiologist, um, Dr. Allison Rudy, and she has always been my sort of canary in the coal mine regarding, mm. you know, so something of this nature. She can really understand the science and she was tracking everything and she was calling me with with such an internal panic. I could hear it in her early on. And then and then while she was sort of, you know, letting me know how bad it was going to be before, of course, everyone else did. Um, yeah. She also said to she also said to me because she knew that when the pandemic hit, she would be isolated because she was going to be at the hospital. And when she came home, she didn't want to expose friends and family. Um, and so she said very plainly, you know, I think this is going to be a really trying time for me and the healthcare professionals I work with. How might I best record a video diary so that I can sort of remember what this time was like and and save it for myself to look back on it? And, and that was the impetus for, for me to say, wait a second, I, I would think that not only do many doctors probably wanna share this unique story and side of the story, but actually that those of us who are civilians are really, really need to hear that also that story because we were in the opposite uh, reality, which is isolated and totally distant from this very real threat. And so then what was that conversation like that the two of you had? Well, so I so here I am. Uh, I just finished my my feature documentary. It was just started touring the one about the journalist Robert Fisk. This is not a movie, and I had just flown back from Los Angeles uh, from a screening in L.A. Like literally, in uh, I think like just a early few, March, early yes. March, mm -hmm. and um, and I was very much in denial. Like hearing the reports, my I have a brother who lives in Beijing, you know. And uh, he was in lockdown since December and they were going through everything. I, but and we I was just this, thought like, oh, that's I was terrible. in this denial where it was like, you know, oh, this is, that's in China, they contained it, you know, they're, it's not coming over here. This is just a SARS situation because in fact, I was in, in Guangzhou at the time SARS broke and I came back to Canada and quarantined for, uh, for uh, seven days back in 2002 or whatever it was. Anyway, uh, so I was in denial, but I was also kind of in a funk because it was becoming a reality that I wouldn't be able to travel with this new film of mine. And, um, and that was, and that I guess then the, the, the kind of link up was like, yeah, it was and like, he was like, we got to do this. And I was like, yeah, yeah. That's, you mm. know. And, and I think, you know, I think as a documentary filmmaker, Young can sense when something is a story that we're going to want to be witness to. And so he, he was like, yeah, let's, let's do that. 
let's yeah. capture this let's capture what we thought was more of a time capsule but now we see has been relevant for a long longer period than we thought um and the uh, task well the beginning the task seemed daunting just to figure out who could po who could populate the film who, yeah, and how, who would be the voices of this and film how would and, we do that, yeah. and what is the approach and and is it going to be but i think very quickly we we determined that it was going to be through the voices of the doctors through these video diaries um that we wouldn't editorialize too much the uh that that process of them recording these video diaries right. and um and that we wanted to make sure that it was uh that it wouldn't be the headline kind of um, ripped from the headline story that we were telling, that it would be much more, uh, you know, a little slow burn in that way. So is this the first time the two of you have collaborated? And, and if not, how is this one different? <laughs> other than, other, than, other you know, than your daughter, other than you know, daughter, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that 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 project is uh, an ongoing collaboration. Uh, yeah, um, you know what's funny is before the pandemic, Young and I have been pretty. We pretty, vowed never to work. Together. We vowed never to work never, together. We, we know what that's like, and we you we know. we both have very strong creative personalities and sensibilities, yeah. and yeah. we knew that it might put a strain on our relationship. But you know, like the pandemic has brought to everybody, you make different choices because you're given some pretty exquisite parameters. And as soon as COVID hit and we were stuck in this house, but as artists and storytellers, of course, the impulse is even stronger to tell a story and to find stories to tell that we were just here together. And we thought, well, okay, I guess it's time. We were sort of like, yeah, there's no other, I mean, yeah, this could be our our uh, our reality for the next while. And yeah, it has been. Yeah, yeah. We've which been collaborating been like, more, much so much more this year. Yeah. So 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 two of you are like, we're already in the house together yeah. with we're our daughter. It. Why not add a little bit more Tinder <laughs> into the fire and let's oh. start a, a project together? Richard, let's, we were let's very make aware of it. Yeah. Fun. Let's this make was, this a fun year. <laughs> I'm joking. Let's you know I'm joking. A party year, a year of partying. This was yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it was intense. Like, obviously, you, you know, you've seen the film. The content is quite yeah. heavy. It yeah. was, I would uh, literally come down. And I was also working on another new oh, yeah. project remotely. So yeah. I was working full time on that project. I'd come downstairs and Annie's um, receiving, processing, processing the, yeah. the, the videos that are being sent to us. And, and she'd be weeping from one of those very, you know, very emotional uh, snippets yeah. from Dr. Yeah. Brady, for example, the doctor in, 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 uh, in Boston. And it was just like, it was heavy times, man. Those, that first surge, March to July, that was heavy times, you know? And I think we were all feeling the, you know, the density of that situation, which is like feeling the apocalypse around the corner, yeah. you know? And I still think it still kind of feels like that after all these months. But I have and, to and say, I, oh yeah, go uh, ahead. Huh? Oh, so go ahead, Anne. Well, I just wanted to say that as heavy as it was, you know, how grateful we were to actually have something to work on that was relevant to that moment. You know, mm -hmm. uh, nothing grounded me more than receiving those video diaries, nothing. I, I think it's yeah, actually yeah. harder to be floating into this new, really strange reality of being isolated, which I just have never, never considered this a possibility and to have their stories come in every night just made me so so aware of exactly what we were fighting against and also to put my struggles quote unquote in total relativity you know the perspective was very clear so it didn't feel it, it was actually I was really glad to have it, honestly. And I wish, I wish we still had it. I wish I mean, they were still sending us diaries. I mean, you put it into Annie. Annie would beautiful. say you would you would said in context like while we were well, you maybe want to say it because I'm, I'm just oh, going to say oh, no, it. No, I don't know it. what you're saying. Well, she was she had written about how the fact that you know while while we were worrying about how to go buy groceries and like wash down things, you know, back save in the early paper. days, yeah. how to save toilet paper. Meanwhile, these frontline doctors yeah. and one of them being my cousin, you know, are um, are fighting the virus head on so uh, yeah, risk putting sobering reality risk. yeah I, I must admit uh in watching your other interviews together ladies and gentlemen they've done they've, they're even more funny and and more together so i was joking about all that other stuff just because it gets better we right we get better yeah, <laughs> just because we can just cause, in other words I, I i joke there's no uh you know a subtext to this where i oh i saw something but no i, I was watching your other <laughs> oh, interviews yeah. And the two of you are truly a dynamic duo. I, I, a lot of people, I'm sure, have said that. You, you, you know, one of the things about seeing the doctors um, express their stuff 
is, you know, throughout the pandemic and in, in, in my dealings with hospitals over the last five years, because my father, they, they don't generally do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we have seen it expressed over the pandemic, this has given, I think, a heart to a part of our workforce, our healthcare workforce. We knew it was there because they show up every day. Mm-hmm. But then in pandemic 19, you really selected those parts that they may not be crying Mm. but they're crying Mm. yeah I mean I think that yeah I mean I think the point around that is we were getting the sense uh intaking a lot of information 24 7 the coverage in 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 the media uh and and getting a sense of you know People were trying to figure things out as they were going along, and we didn't, nobody really knew what the virus was, right? And we were still trying to figure it out, uh, but we weren't getting the sense of that um, emotional side of the deep emotional contemplate contemplative side of it, which, do- as we know, doctors to be and can be uh, very thoughtful, and and that's what we wanted to tap into. And I also think that doctors are so trained to compartmentalize, you know. When they, they have to up, kind of, right? They have, they to. have to, yes. I course, think for yeah. survival, absolutely. But also so so that when they're in the hospital dealing with patients, there's one side, there's one side that they present. And then of course, when they're home in 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 close company, they might show a different side. But I feel like the pressures of a global pandemic also gave a little allowance to them to open up even more because it was just too much to hold. And, and I think it was dangerous for them. Mm-hmm. As we've talked about, of course, the mental health crisis, not just for healthcare professionals, but for everyone is the sort of second invisible pandemic happening right now. And yeah, we, 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 we lucked out with some doctors who were willing to share, but I think many probably needed to share and hopefully you know, everyone had someone they could share with that maybe wasn't a video diary, but they had someone to share yeah. with at this time. Yeah. And and this is different for the two of you because, you know, you're not there. I know for me, um, mm-hmm. at least I can talk to somebody through a camera or I'm in the field. The two of you were neither of those two, but, and you had to, how are you communicating with them? I guess if it wasn't that way yeah. and how strange was that as filmmakers? Well, for me, totally strange. Yeah. I'm used to being in the field. I'm used to being on the ground. Um, you know, I need, I, I usually feel like I need that intimacy, that contact and that relationship building, which is so essential to the process. In regards to this film, the approach was unique in that, you know, we weren't directing really. We had reached out to a handful of doctors through our contacts. Uh, and again, my cousin, Brian Chang is one of the doctors in the film uh, who, who I had more immediate contact with um, and could kind of persuade him to be more involved Persuade, with, you know, <laughs> getting into the filming of himself, which he is not. Yeah, you know, uh, he's very, actually, very unassuming, shy guy. He doesn't like to be in front of the camera. I, don't, I at think all. he'd like never I taken s- a selfie before we asked him. Yeah, I really had to twist his arm, and he did it for really? us. Really, um, but uh, um, the candor that the the kind of part of it, getting them to open up, was not intent. We didn't push that, you know, and I think occasionally, so basically there was no interface with any of the characters. Even Brian was pretty removed because he is a pretty shy guy. Um, it was hard to get him on the phone, you know, so he didn't come across that way. I must say in the film. No, he doesn't. I I think, um, there was a little bit of like, give us a little, like, I think the guidelines we set for the doctors was very important, right? We sent out this original, this initial kind of, here's what we'd love. And, um, just let the recording roll on your cameras. The biggest thing we had to deal with was just technically yeah. I, the doctors don't know how to film. They don't know cameras. Landscape, they don't understand. Landscape. So there was always a little adjustment, <laughs> technically speaking. But other than yeah, yeah. that, it was like yeah. very subtle. And you know, which is we, so weird for me. Yeah. And, but I think hmm. it was again. It was uh, an initial. Um, compromise it felt like a compromise initially like oh well we can't be there so this is what we have to do but actually it that restriction helped. The restriction yeah. feels also true to the pandemic had we been there it might have felt strange or something again about this like distant um otherworldly diary to kind of no one but everyone felt right too and what was interesting is that when once we relinquish that control 
And we just said, I interfaced a lot through email, but very, there was no direction. Maybe there was like, can you clarify this question for me? Or can you tell me what it felt like when this happened? There were some, a few questions that I said, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, no problem. Um, that, 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 so receiving what we received was in some ways like the least mediated sort of outpouring from these doctors. And I think that's, you can kind of feel that, that it's just them literally putting down what they felt I mean, that day. And the other thing that's so intentional with the film though, is the device of having the doctors be only in these screens more yeah. or less as the confessional window, right? In this frame here. And then uh, we intentionally left it so that any of those, what we've been calling interstitials between those diaries, which essentially is B-roll, um, but B-roll that was very, uh, uh, you know, very particular. I mean, we were looking with our cinematographer in New York, um, Derek Howard, we were looking for footage that was, you know, kind of empty, devoid of any humans, you know, kind of just these, these quiet, eerie frames and stills. Um, and then he would catch the, 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 the cinematographer would catch these crazy shots, you know, like the, the rabbit running through the garbage in, in New York or, uh, and then, so we worked on just keeping it empty which mostly the film is. And meanwhile, you know, the intention was that there was the acknowledgement that there was chaos happening outside of these frames um, of the doctor's confessions. And then we did a little pickup shooting with a couple of the doctors, Dr. Brady and Dr. Chang, um, just to, you know, kind of build that bridge, that link that they are inter intersecting with that eerie landscape a little bit. Does that make sense? And then in the end, uh, uh, in the end, I think, you know, we wanted it to, that kind of approach, I think fills the, the context, the void of that, uh, of that world that, that they're existing in, that we are existing in, in the movie. Yes, that is, um, it was, it definitely read that way. Um, it was sort of the, you know, the quiet shadowing of mm -hmm. what they were living through. That's a good um, reason, yeah. The, I'm around a million people, but I'm around nobody. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, that which is that, that 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 crash uh, of humanity. Speaking of humanity, what did you learn from those three characters mm. about humanity as you were doing this? Mm. And what is what did you select to show the world about humanity from who they are? Such a good question. That's a huge question. That's so got, good. That's a Richard question. That's, that's so good. good. <laughs> That's so good. I mean, uh, you know, not really. I mean, I'll just say this. So this is just from the gut because I haven't thought about yeah, yeah, this. this um, but me. I think, mm -hmm. honestly, they showed me what I hoped, what I what I always hope is there in humans. Um, that that, it, I mean, this unprecedented global uh, crisis that we're all in. Never, never before have we all been. In, a, in the same crisis at the same time. And, you know, it can go either way. It does go either way, it's depending on how you're feeling in the day or what you're witnessing, which country you're in, right? Some of it's really dark and really tough. And some of it is so good. And some silver linings really pop up there. And to me, when I, when I hear, again, that personal sacrifice, um, but you know what's more interesting actually is that all of them, nobody ever talked about sacrifice. They would all say like, yeah, people are calling us heroes, but it's just, it's my job. This is what I signed up for. This is, this is why I was called to medicine initially. And it makes me feel useful. I feel, you know, all, all of those things, again, just it, it, re, it reinforced and reaffirmed my belief in humanity as you know, as like a, it's a human project. <laughs> it's a human, it's a human thing we're all facing. So I, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the other intentions of this film and we strategically decided that we wanted to get it out and release it before the, uh, the, the past election. And, uh, and there was an intention there because I think when I look back at the humanity in the film and the question of what it left me with was a, a kind of anger and looking at the sacrifice these doctors were, were putting forward uh, without the infrastructure, without the support of, um, you know, federal government. And they were just sort of operating on their own terms, trying to figure this out, just fighting their way through it, um, you know, relying on the um, bolstering of the community. You know, of, often Dr. Brady talks about that one particular time she had never felt since 9-11, where, where it was medical frontline workers just like arm in arm, 
you know, and they were fighting something and, and nobody else was there to kind of like usher them through a little. It was just them alone in that way. And that to me was, uh, it's angering. It's an embold, you know, it's an, it just, it, uh, it makes me step back and see how much was at, uh, at risk and at stake through these doctors, you know? And then when you break it down, each character is, does sort of represent something. So, you know, Dr. Brady is the core, the emotional core, I think really, really open in, in giving a lot of uh, those conflicts, those moral conflicts she faces as a, as a um, you know, ICU doctor. And then you have my cousin, Dr. Chang, who is, in my opinion, kind of the adventurous person who is uh, kind of into it for, in the beginning to seek, uh, um, you know, sort of, it was sort of like- Fascinating. A fascination for him to see and witness the, the, the virus. And then later, of course, you see this turn in his character where it, it really hits home for him. Yeah, sober. Uh, the sobering moment. And then for Dr. Isola, which is just completely shocking. And I think also a slightly, uh, you know, I don't know, social commentary on the American health system is just the fact that she was fired. Uh, uh, an emergency physician let, fired let or furloughed yeah. or let go from her job. And, um, and that's shocking that that's happening with the private healthcare system in America. Yeah. What do you think was the quality in each of your characters that had them move through this heroic arc in their lifestyle, in their life, excuse me, during the pandemic, that they themselves were coming to grips with, that they actually had signed up for it when they said the Hippocratic Oath out loud. They wanted to be this. They really are that. But in the end, the quality that came through in the interviews or the <laughs> their testimonials, you were able to look through that. What was that quality, you think, for each one of them that got them through the gray space of that reality? I guess I am what I wanted to be, and now it's here, but it is a horrible, horrible situation that maybe I'd rather not happen to actually be in this situation. Yeah. I don't know what that is. What is that? Grit or, or? Well, let's let's be honest. I mean, we know for a fact that there were doctors out there who just didn't want to be a part of this and they stepped away and they stepped back. There right? weren't many. There weren't many, but there were Sorry, some. Sorry, I don't mean it. Yeah, I'm not trying to. There were some. <laughs> yeah, there were some. That's a good catch. Thank you for that. But but you know what I mean? Like, I think there is a quality that defines a, a, a many in the medical profession, not only, you know, frontline doctors, but we're talking about nurses and whatever, wherever you want to go down that list, you know, even definitely long, uh, you know, the caregivers and, 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 and all those people that put a lot on the line to take care of someone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I get emotional thinking about, it. I'm just going to get emotional thinking about this, but uh, you know, my father is a, is a doctor physician recently retired and I remember uh, growing up as a kid, just knowing that he wasn't at home at three in the morning or getting up to go to the, the hospital because he, he, he got called in to help somebody. And I remember he was a kind of an old country doctor, you know, and, and, and he would go door to door and we'd, my brother and I'd be waiting for him as he went to go spend an, like, endless, like an, what seems like an hour with his, with his patient. You know, um, and he and he would tell my brother and I to honk the horn after a certain time it hit, so that he would come out eventually. <laughs> but he's the guy with the black bag, and he would go around. You know, and I think how cool is that? Um, yeah, yeah. I think there is something about that sacrifice doctors make, uh, and and I think it's one of those professions that requires that oath, um, and and that and they take it, and it's kind of drilled into them. Yeah. you know, as uh, all the training they go through. And I think a lot of doctors seek that moment when they have to, they, you know, even Dr. Rudy, your friend, wants that moment where they have to just put their life in front of, you know, a way, yeah. you know, and, and sacrifice. Yeah, you know, Does that make if, sense? if I can quote Dr. Alison Rudy, I feel like, you know, she, she actually didn't see many COVID patients because of where the hospital was located and whatnot. And she was in a funny way disappointed you know, she, she says that, you know, because most of her practice is elective surgeries. Mm. Um, and that's actually, you know, she's like, I'm, I'm so happy to make people feel comfortable and get through surgery safely. But actually what she, what she signed up initially to do was this greater good project. Mm -hmm. because, you know, they're professional caregivers, really, um, just, you know, in a very specific way. And I think 
that those, those who are called to medicine and healthcare, including the lab techs and the people who clean the hospital and the nurses and everyone, those who are called there for that reason, this is a moment for them that, you know, again, you can feel that, that like capital U usefulness to the world. Um, yeah. And then those, I guess, who are just in it for money, I don't know who those are, yeah. but maybe, maybe that's when they thought, oh, I guess I'm able to take a three month vacation here or, um, you know, but yeah. How long did you know them from the beginning of the process to the end of the process? What, how long did you know them and how long were you talking really quickly? Yeah. Um, we, we, we knew them all March to August we were filming. March we didn't know them beforehand, well, we, only, only well, Dr. And Chang. We, fo we followed six to seven doctors and a few of those doctors we've known for a long time. Um, but if for whatever reason, the, the context, whatever they faced wasn't, didn't, didn't sort of present a full picture of sure. the first surge. Um, which so, happens, right? Yeah, which yeah. happens. So the three that we chose that we have ended up being new. We, they were new, new to both of us. Um, and yeah. how long, I guess I'm trying to get the context here, right? Because sometimes yeah. we meet folks in certain situations. Uh, and in this situation, it was not your typical, um, let's talk, let's shake hands, let's meet. I come down to meet no. you. We were talking about earlier. Did it feel long? I mean, it probably did feel like you knew them longer. And if you were to say you only knew them for maybe five months, did it feel, how much longer did it feel in, in months, would you say, that you oh knew? Oh my them? gosh. Yeah. Well, time in 2020 and during the pandemic is, <laughs> a no, no, is, no. A, is an almost impossible Which, to track. No, no. But, me but I, think that's yeah. a, I mean, it, it feels like, I think what was really special about this relationship with them was that they were, we felt like they were confessing to us, yeah, right? Yeah. And there was something so personal about that. And you've talked- Almost about, like priests, right? I, I mean, I'm not film priests, if you will. I mean, yeah. people do talk in about, oh, this is interesting too. You know, I think I brought this up with you too, which is like often in, in and Richard, maybe you relate too, which is that uh, the camera is often a confessional, feels mm -hmm. confessional. Like sometimes with family, when I'm making a film about somebody and they don't open up amongst their families, the minute the camera is there, it's almost, there's this weird thing where they just feel so, people feel so comfortable to open up. And I find there's that little, I don't know how to put a pinpoint that, but there's a, a sort of an effect that happens. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it's this, and it is this, I think it is the screen knowing that you're talking to avoid, to, into a void that will reach somebody. And I think yeah. there's something about that that's really cool. Um, and that, I, I tried to and I tried to talk to you about that. It was just so hard to, to find for me because usually the, the camera me, is the confession. But yeah, for me though, I think my my understanding is that everyone always has something to say. It's whether someone will listen or not. That's it. And and for me, we simply asked, and those who wanted to share their story said yes. And and it we I had right. we had conversations with everyone for 20, 30 minutes, and then we never talked on the phone again. I just received and said, thank you so much. I saw this. Yeah. I'm so sorry. What I was your sign off? You had a sign off on your emails. That was really kind of, well, maybe it's cheesy now, but I can't like, even remember. Uh, it was, anyway, <laughs> she had a nice, but, but you know, I, I, yeah. If, so I feel like, yeah, but get back to your original question. I, I feel so close with them, but what was funny, so close with them, each of them, I feel like we've known them for years and years and that yeah. they're our very good friends. But then we had our first, Q, first Q and a a few months ago and they were like, Oh, hey, that's what you look like. Yeah, it was <laughs> we weird. realized that they was had weird. never seen us, which is yeah. So oh, no, I'm yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So which it was is really, very trusting, but maybe also great because they just were really yeah. giving it to you know. And Dr. Brady has talked about the fact that she wishes that she could keep recording these diaries yeah. because she's felt that they have been very helpful, therapeutic, um, therapeutic in a way. And and something that I've loved that she's talked about in past uh, Q and As is that uh, amongst her. Her ward, they've started um, a wellness check-in with uh, with everyone on Zoom. You know, all the employees, everyone that she works with, and in a way, I feel like uh, it's sort of connected to this idea of the the therapy of of communication and, and Tell your story, yeah. telling your story. You know, it, it brings us back to that that great documentary on the General Hospital a AIDS ward. Mm -hmm. um, yet we had the, that AIDS ward and the nurses and doctors were everywhere in the world, as opposed to just the AIDS wards back in the 80s, which was, I mean, the only one I knew because I grew up in San Francisco was a general hospital. Mm. And it's just that parallel is um, yeah. uh, sobering. 
since yeah. you've known them this way, I, and I really have to ask you this, what do, since you know them, what do they say about us? Well, that's the civilians. You mean the everyday us, yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly, there has not been much criticism. <laughs> if I was them, I kept no, I mean, and, and I mean, Annie, um, given who they are, yeah. Oh yes. How, how well you know them and what their existence is and what you learned about this tough yeah. time of who they are. What do who they are say about us? Oh, I see. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, uh, that uh, the, 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 the gut reaction is like something about like um, trust and, and putting trust in, uh, it, you know, I think there is, I don't know. There's something about just stepping into their, well, seeing through their points of view. I think you see that um, in their confessions that they worry about the decisions and choices they make. Obviously there are moral ethical questions that they're confronted with, certainly in a pandemic, certainly when it comes down to, you know, uh, God forbid, you know, moments of triage and such. Um, and you see them grappling with that, that I think maybe the reflection, um, uh, uh, you know, is this, um, you know, is this great uh, uh, need for trust that we have to put into these professionals and that, you know, we, we are at many times at, at their mercy. They decide if we're in serious health problems, you know, whether and how to treat us and they take, and I think, I think that the flip side of that is just making sure that we're not, you know, I think people, uh, you know, I think, I, I think I'm leaning over to like where things are with the vaccine right now, for example, that there's a lot, that there, there is unusually, and I don't know the percentage, maybe you know the statistic, but I, I'm under the understanding that there is a, 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 a need to persuade people that it's important to get vaccinated. You know, not everyone is on that side yet. And I think when I think about doctors and the frontline workers like that, I, I think that there is this, uh, there's this need to see I think there's a need to for for us to for them to for us to see them as as um, as necessary and and, and trustworthy. You know? Does that make sense? I have no idea what I'm saying, but I you said I a lot. No, no, and, and <laughs> they, they, we do need to see them as trustworthy. It's true. And did you need, want to add something there? Well, I wanted. I actually just wanted <laughs> clarification. Do you mean the royal us, like all of us, everyone, civilians, or us as filmmakers and artists? Or I took it as the royal us. us. The royal us, all of us, everybody. You know, yeah. What does it say about what is what is now that we know more about them and what it takes to be a frontline worker in a global pandemic? What does it say about us? You know, in many ways, it's been a call to action, um, which is inaction actually at this at this moment uh, in time. But it 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 again when you when you see your everyday struggle in perspective and in relation to somebody else's, it does knit you together, especially at a time like this. Um, it knits you together in the same fight, if you will, well, however trite that sounds, but I feel like there isn't actually as much a divide as I thought, I guess. We're doing very different work in our day to day, but we are all, I mean, so cheesy, but we're all really in this together. And it felt like that when I was watching them. Well, I think, I think, you know, and, sorry. Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I would, I, I would cheesy, say but... basically that I wish if I had, a, you know, if I got the virus that I hope that I was in one of their hands, because <laughs> I know that they don't judge, you know, uh, they wouldn't judge me, they would try to save me. That's the basic thing. That's oh, all I God. would want. And um, <laughs> I can't get emotional, you, you know, um, you know, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, certainly there are heroes among us, as they say, and I think pandemic 19 gives us a slice of how they come to understand that they have become that. And for us as viewers, the Royal us see, sees that it's in many people around us and that it is uplifting. Mm, yeah. Good. I hope, yeah, I hope we, we were, we were very careful thinking about how we would end the film and also we ended it in September really when we didn't know 
even where it would get to. Um, if we look at the numbers now, we really, we did we couldn't have predicted this even having tracked the numbers for so many months. And yeah, it was, it's such a dangerous thing to end a pandemic film on a hopeful note. Um, but we also wanted to show all of the incredible things that the hum humanity has done to get us thus far. And then we kept the ticker counting going a little, the, I mean, that's the, the reminder going, which it's is the reminder, which is that's actually right. The deeper question here is like, but are, can we all, can we all really do what we need to do to stop this thing? And it's clear that we haven't been able to totally yet, but we're all working on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was the impetus of the film as well, which was that the, that you were, you were, we were hoping that this film would have yeah. influence on people who were not really taking it as seriously right. as other people were taking it. And, uh, and I'm hoping as the film is rolled out, you know, um, uh, World Channel, PBS World Channel on February 1st is doing the, the national release, um, that I'm hoping that this, you know, people will get to see it and get something out of it, you know. Take it seriously again. Take it seriously. Yeah. yeah. If you were to do it again, would you do anything different? And if you would, what would that difference be? Well, we do something different. I, I would continue filming. You keep going. <laughs> so we, we would make going. the short for the election. And then I think we just did not know it was going to last so long. And we, we had to make that call pretty early on. Yeah. Um, I would have, we would have made the short while the, hopefully the doctors would have kept uh, sending in diaries because the trajectory of their continued stories has been so interesting. You know, Pooja uh, was let go. She then got a job in telemedicine, which is a really interesting sort of future visioning for healthcare system in, in America. She's graduating with an MBA from MIT, which she has been uh, in for two or three years. Mm -hmm. And she was hoping even before the pandemic to be part of the change for the healthcare uh, system and industry in America. And now she's more made it, more motivated than ever. Ginny, of course, who's really in the heart of things as a critical care pulmonary uh, specialist um, has just been riding waves and waves of COVID-19 and Brian who was a bit nonchalant in the beginning in Northern California, went to New York, got a sobering view there, went back to Northern California, and now they're really in it. So now he belatedly, um, luckily he went to New York and really got a taste for what it is to be in the middle of a surge that's really taking over hospitals. And now he's in it again in Northern California. So, you know, for me, that's just, yeah, I kind of wish we had kept going because the story is, and it's going to keep going for, who knows how I feel you. I yeah. definitely feel you as a, as a broadcast journalist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you might. We're, we're in there for, you know, a week at a time, maybe. Um, and there's so many compelling people yeah. Yeah. and but people that are in, invigorate. Yeah. Do, do you feel there's a fatigue around pandemic stories? Are you fatigued? I'm or, not fatigued. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I think so long as we continue uh, to work hard at digging into uh, what is the story of the day um, yeah. in an earnest and, and my, 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 my mentors would always say, there's always a story. Mm. It is don't ever come back to me and say, sorry, uh, the lead's dead. That's not, you know, it's not mm. happening or it's already been told. Well, then what you know is there are five others. So I don't think it is at all um, we're not tired of it. It's more of we're tired of the pain of it. Mm. Um, and so we can still cover the story. But in, as both of you know, the arc of uh, the collective viewership, we need to follow, right? And yeah. be ahead of it and stretch it so that, you know, you, the purpose of Pandemic 19 is to do that, right? So that we think in different ways and mm -hmm. we might we might act in a way that is better for our society. So let me finish with that then, yeah. is what is that uh, push to society and, and what we think we are and what we want to be and what we might consider being based on watching Pandemic 19? Yeah, I mean, well, on a very immediate note, I hope everyone sees this and remembers to wear a mask out. Mm. And I hope I hope they, take their personal daily struggles, which are real, they're real. Um, 
I, but I hope they take them again in relativity and remember just by seeing those doctors and hearing their stories of what's really happening to the folks that are getting sick um, and, and in the hospitals, that they remember that when they, you know, when they're feeling their own everyday struggles and to, and to you know, listen to the, to listen to the protocols and guidelines in a very, in a very simple way. That's what I hope. Yeah. And in a greater way, I just hope we all feel connected by this rather than divided, I guess. I mean, the film ends with that haunting ticker counter yeah. into infinity. And I'm hoping, you know, the takeaway for society is to be like, let's stop that. Let's stop that echo, that echo thing happening yeah. with that ticker counter. Let's make those numbers stop. And so um, with the new administration, um, new plans in front, I, I think there's, you know, there's distant light there, I think. So hopefully, um, good things in a few months. Well, just like we were talking about the three doctors that you followed um, during their journey, parts of their journey, and they decide to stand up and go to work. Uh, again, one of the doctors, Dr. Chang, deciding to get up and go across the country, as so many did across the country. You know, that is a testament to, I think, one of the values that we are taught to embrace. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm you know, I think that is invigorating to a lot of viewers when they see what these doctors do to show the vulnerability, but more important, uh, mm -hmm. more importantly, that is part of their strength, but also then their fortitude to move and go forward despite mm -hmm. all of that. And that was, you know, what I took away from yeah. pandemic 19. And that is, I think, um, something we all whether it's a time capsule or not, or whether you get up one day and you need something that's invigorating, it may be a difficult time, but I think it's invigorating. It shows us what we can do despite the most difficult um, context of our decade, of our mm -hmm. lifetime, of, of the century. So thank you, Young Chang. Thank you so much. Annie Katsura mm -hmm. Rollins, thank you as well. And um, Richard. February 1st, right? Yeah. World Channel, yeah. PBS. Go see it. PBS. I got the sneak peek. I don't want to, you know, which is great. <laughs> so that's the benefit of being able to hang out with cool directors like these two. And vice um, versa, Richard. It's great chatting with you. And yeah, I know it, it was all the two. I really enjoy how we're able to get into um, what is important to talk about today, and that's yeah. what Pandemic Nineteen is about. So thank you both, thank and you. Uh, I look forward to the next one. <laughs> and, and, yeah, thanks. And vice versa, uh, just add that, you know, you, the film you made, uh, Sky Blossoms, uh, is just, uh, I think, has link linkage to our film and and uh, look at caregivers, yeah. student caregivers, children taking care of their parents and grandparents. Uh, such a powerful film and a statement to, to that humanity that we're all seeking right now. So yeah. thank you so much. Thanks. thanks for that. Appreciate it. All right. See you next time. See you Bye. next time. <laughs>